Hello class, thank you for joining me for another lecture. Today's lecture is going to focus on a paper by Marion Bertrand and Sendhil Mullenathan called Are Emily and Greg More Employable Than Lakeisha and Jamal? A Field Experiment in Labor Market Discrimination. So just to provide a little bit of context for this paper, up until now, we've thought through several different models of how employer prejudice, employee prejudice, or customer prejudice might affect um, the earnings and employment levels of marginalized groups of workers, right? Racial minorities, women, perhaps religious minorities, compared to dominant or advantaged workers. And as we've seen, these different models come to strikingly different conclusions about things like the role of market competition in either perpetuating disadvantage in the Coat and Lowry model or the Basu model, or eliminating disadvantage or eliminating discrimination in the Becker employer discrimination model. So as a result, if we wanna be able to understand the real role that discrimination plays in labor markets and which of these theories really um, adequately describes the world that we live in, we need some way of measuring labor market discrimination. And this is important for a couple of reasons, right? First, of course, if we're, if we're unable to find evidence that market discrimination occurs on a wide scale, that would suggest that Becker's taste-based models are more likely to be correct. We would essentially argue that even though we see that prejudice exists in, in, the, in our broader society, right? we know that negative stereotypes of certain groups exist, if we don't see evidence of market discrimination, that would suggest that those stereotypes are unable to affect the wages or employment opportunities of workers. On the other hand, if we see that employer discrimination is a widespread phenomenon, that would suggest that some of these models that do create persistent long-term discrimination, right, such as customer discrimination or the Coat and Lowry model or the Basu model, play a larger role in the reality we live in. But the other reason it's important is being able to understand where discrimination plays a larger or smaller role can also help us understand which of these models is most likely at play. If we see discrimination primarily in contexts where getting accurate information about worker productivity is difficult, that might suggest that something like the Coat and Lowry model is a good description of reality. If we see discrimination primarily in contexts where customers are directly interacting with employees, that would suggest we might be seeing customer taste-based discrimination. And if we see discrimination primarily in jobs like managerial roles that involve interaction with and buy-in from a lot of different people, where we might think that strategic complementarities play a large role, that would suggest that something like the Basu model might be at play. So understanding where discrimination is happening and being able to, to identify discrimination is gonna be a really first order fundamental issue when we try to look at, at the economics of discrimination empirically. So in this paper, we'll focus specifically on discrimination based on race. And one thing that we can say with confidence is that there are significantly different labor market outcomes on average for black workers versus white workers. So as you can see here, if we look at the difference in unemployment rates between black men and white men, and between black men, women and white women from about 1980 to the present, we can see that black men and black women have had persistently higher rates of unemployment than white men and white women. And likewise, we can see that the average earnings of white men have been persistently higher than the average earnings of black men. At this point, the gap is about it, black men earn about 70% of what white men earn on average among full-time workers. And the earnings gap between white women and black women has actually increased over time, such that at this point, black women earn about 82% of what white women earn on average. So it's very clear that race plays a large role in the labor market, that racial, ident that racial categories are correlated with labor market outcomes. What's not clear from this is the degree to which this is a result of discrimination in the labor market, as opposed to the result of inequities in other parts of society. In other words, different access to education, different quality of childhood neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. Things that occur in people's lives that affect their earnings outside of the employer-employee relationship. In other words, we can think of this as potentially reflecting discrimination against black workers and in favor of, of white workers, or potentially reflecting productivity differences on the basis of other characteristics such as education. So the traditional tool that we've used to try to disentangle the effect of discrimination on wage gaps from the effect of other observable characteristics is something called a Oaxaca blinder decomposition, which is a pretty cool tool that I'm not gonna go into too much detail about right now. But effectively what it boils down to is we can control for all of the differences between black and white workers that we can observe in data and then see how much of the wage gap can't be explained by those differences. So for example, here, the set of researchers from the Federal Reserve 
tried to see how much of the wage gap between black and white workers can be attributable to differences in education, differences in age, differences in industry and occupation, differences in state of origin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what they concluded was that these differences account for about half of the wage gap between black and white men and about two thirds of the wage gap between black and white women. So if we wanted to conclude that anything not explained by differences in age and education and industry must be a result of discrimination, this would suggest that discrimination plays a pretty large role in determining wage differences between black and white workers. The problem with this though, is that the unexplained gap in wages between black and white workers here can also be the result of any other differences in characteristics between black workers and white workers. So for example, if we thought that the um, quality of the average high school attended by black children was worse than the quality of the average high school attended by white children, we might think that among workers with similar numbers of years of education, black, black workers might have received a lower quality education and thus be less productive in the labor market. This would be a, an inequity that we would attribute maybe to broader racism, but we wouldn't want to attribute that to labor market discrimination. In other words, to discrimination on behalf of employers. Fundamentally, the problem with this approach is that employers, when they're deciding who to hire and what to pay them, can see a lot more about employees than we can as econometricians. In other words, because employers have a lot more information than we do, any decision they make on the basis of information that they see and we don't see is gonna end up looking like an unexplained difference using some sort of regression adjustment technique. And of course, this can go in both directions, right? The bias from this can go in both directions because a lot of these differences that we see, right? Differences in education or differences, especially differences in industry and occupation might themselves be a consequence of labor market discrimination. Right, you might expect that black workers work in lower paid industries and occupations on average because of discrimination in higher paid industries and occupations. Okay, so if the fundamental problem here, the fundamental problem with this regression approach is that employers know a lot more about the workers that they're choosing to pay or not pay or hire or not hire than we as econometricians or as economists see. What Bertrand and Mullenathan do is they say, let's look at an environment where the economists know just as much about the workers as the employers do. In other words, let's look at, an, at a context where there can't be these other unexplained differences between black and white workers that could potentially drive differences in employer behavior. And in that context, if we've ruled out everything else, we'll be able to confidently argue that any differences we see in the treatment of employees by, by employers is a result of race. So the way that they do that is they set up a very simple experiment test for labor market discrimination. Instead of looking at real people, looking for real jobs, which of course introduces all of the various biases that come from the fact that real people are immensely complicated and differ from each other in a lot of ways, what they do is they invent people. They create false resumes on which they either put a traditionally black name or a traditionally white name. Then they send them out to real companies that are hiring workers and see whether they get a higher callback rate on the resumes with white names than on the resumes with black names. And indeed, what they find is that the resumes with white names get much higher callback rates on average than resumes with black names, even though the names are placed on the resumes at random. And so they argue this is essentially irrefutable proof that having a black name, a traditionally black name on your resume, decreases the likelihood that you're going to get a callback from an employer. So the advantage of this experiment is that it's incredibly, incredibly simple. It carves away a lot of the complexities of the real world in order to give us a very clear test of the existence of discrimination. On the other hand, the disadvantage of this approach, the weakness of this approach, is that because of its simplicity, it can be difficult to extrapolate from this to what we really care about. It can be difficult to know how to take the results of this experiment and use them to understand wage gaps or use them to understand differences in incentives for investment between white and black workers. So our discussion of this paper is going to follow the, is going to go along the following lines. We're going to start by giving a fairly brief description of the strategy that Bertrand and Mullenathan use to carry out their experiment. It's going to be a brief description because as I've said, it's a very simple strategy. They're going to walk through their findings in a little bit of detail and then spend most of the rest of this lecture discussing how to interpret their findings in light of the theories that we've developed. Okay, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.